Frozen for more than 5,000 years on a remote mountain pass, and now lying in a refrigerated tomb, the Iceman. A survivor from the Stone Age. A messenger from the past, bearing secrets of how humans lived nearly a thousand years before the pyramids. He is also a mystery waiting to be solved. Who was he? And how did he die? Was it in battle? Or was he murdered? Now a risky autopsy overturns past theories. DNA, a copper axe, and a last meal surprise the experts as they come closer to understanding our ancient past and to solving the Iceman murder mystery. Some 3,000 years before the birth of Christ, on a remote mountainside high in the Alps, a man made his way through the thin mountain air. The man's life would end in mystery. Was he alone or on the run? What made him undertake his last journey? A puzzle for scientists. His body remained on the mountain for over 5,000 years. until September 1991, when two hikers climbing in the Italian Alps wandered off the trail and stumbled across a gruesome sight. The head and shoulders of a man emerging from the ice. At first, the pathologist responding to the scene assumed this was simply the remains of an unfortunate hiker, one of many lost in the Alps over the years. But this body looks different. It shows almost no signs of decomposition. Its skin and flesh appear to have been freeze-dried. Hands, feet, even eyeballs are still intact. The mountain air and ice who transformed this corpse into a mummy. As the recovery continued, some unusual items emerged. Bits of leather, handmade rope, and a knife with a flint blade. This was no ordinary walker. Initial analysis of his gear suggested he was thousands of years old. The find caused a worldwide sensation. The press dubbed him the Iceman, or Ertzi, after the Ertzdal Mountains where he was found. Eventually, carbon dating confirmed that Ertzi died 5,300 years ago. His are the oldest intact human remains ever recovered. What can they tell us about our own history and the mystery of Ertzi's death? For some reason, his final journey took him up this ridge, along this valley, all the way up. He went from about 300 meters to over 3,000 meters. At first, scientists suspected he was lost in a storm. But mounting evidence began to suggest something else happened to the Iceman. Something more violent. The body was found close to today's border between Italy and Austria. The scene of death was not initially treated as suspicious. 
Now the Iceman's chief conservators visit the remote pass to reappraise the scene. It helps them appreciate the extraordinary circumstances that combine to preserve the body. Erzi was discovered just a hundred meters inside the present Italian border. 5,000 years ago, he had climbed a considerable distance to be later covered by a glacier. Here we are on the top of the mountain. And if you look down in the valley, we see that the distance is very, very long. There are more than 1,500 meters. So we can see here very well the, that he was the glacier and the glacier tends to move down. And normally a dead body would have been transported with the glacier down and destroyed completely. Most bodies lost in glaciers are carried along by the river of ice. They slowly glide down the mountain along with tons of rock and stone grinding together. Alpine glaciers typically move about 30 meters per year. After a few hundred years, most of the debris that gets caught up in them emerges at the bottom along the melting edge of ice. Not Ertzi. The circumstances of Ertzi's death appear extremely unlucky, but for archaeologists, he couldn't have fallen in a better spot. The sun and wind dried his body out completely. Rocks on either side of him formed a small trench. Three meters of snow and ice eventually filled this in, preventing the Iceman's body from being swept into the river of ice that flowed all around it. Fifteen meters to the left or right, his body would have been ground to bits and lost forever. The mountain created the Iceman and then it protected him over more than 50 centuries. In Bolzano, Italy, he's protected again. Just 30 miles from the spot where he died in a specially created museum. Erzi's mummified body is on display. Carefully frozen, in a custom crypt. Temperature minus six and a half degrees centigrade. Relative humidity, 98%. Now, doctors in charge of the body are hoping to get a break in the cold case by conducting a rare and risky procedure. They are letting the Iceman's body defrost. Scientists are flocking to Bolzano to get their hands and instruments on the five millennia old corpse. They will be following fresh leads in the Iceman's death and also in his life at a turning point in human civilization. They will have just nine hours to complete their investigations before the Iceman must be refrozen. Pathologist Eduard Agata Vigel, the caretaker of the Iceman for more than 10 years, is leading an operation teeming with biological hazards. One risk is that scientists who enter the room bring their bacteria and germs with them. Another risk is that we have no way of knowing if there are still living organisms in the mummy itself and if these would be reactivated in the defrosting. If the body is harmed by the defrosting, the loss to scientists would be profound. They are depending on this one corpse to shed light on a crucial time in human history. Erzi is unique. He's from the end of the Stone Age, a time when humans still used stone tools before they'd mastered the art of smelting metal he provides a glimpse of what life was like in those times, with some surprising twists. This find, the man in the ice, 
opened up a whole new window on the ancient world. Five thousand years ago in Europe is a time before countries, before kings, even before the introduction of the wheel. In these alpine valleys, increasing numbers are living in small settlements, beginning to grow crops like wheat and barley, and to raise goats, sheep and cattle. Others are nomadic hunters after wild game. Did growing competition between farmers and hunters lead to Ertzi's death? At least 1,000 years before writing comes to the area, Ertzi's extraordinarily well-preserved gear provides rare clues to prehistoric alpine life. He was still wearing one of his shoes. In the Bolzano Museum, alpine archaeologist Patrick Hunt is joined by paleologist Anna Luisa Pedrotti to carefully examine each item, searching for clues not only about his way of life, but about his final day. Why would he have been carrying these things with him at the time of his death? The shoe is one of the earliest examples of its kind and surprisingly complex. You can just see here at least three different kinds of material. You see grass, you see skin, and you see cord. It's unlikely a man from a stone age would wear shoes all the time. But if he knew he was going to cross the rocky slopes and glaciers of the Alps, shoes like this would be important. The artifacts not only provide personal details about the man who carried them, they prove that Stone Age designs could be surprisingly sophisticated. His backpack, with its wooden frame, seems almost modern. A leather pouch was possibly a waste pack. Chunks of tree fungus, thought to have medicinal powers, served as a first aid kit. Maple leaves were used to carry hot embers for starting fires. Otzi's culture knew the use of every possible plant yes. and stone and wood. They use the optimal material. But venturing into the mountains beyond his settlement could be dangerous. Wolves, wild boar and bears were common. Clashes between settlements and hunters were also possible. So Ertzi carried weapons. Along with his knife, he had a bow and arrows. His quiver, the oldest ever found, accompanied carefully crafted wooden arrows with flint arrowheads chipped to a razor's edge, glued on with pitch made from the sap of a birch tree. The feathers on the shafts are also carefully stuck on to stabilize the arrow in flight. But for some mysterious reason, the bow and arrows were not ready for use. If you count the number of arrows here, easily over a dozen, most of the arrows are completely unusable at this time. Why do we have so many arrows unfinished? This is a huge mystery. He was found with equipment that was not fully prepared. It's as if he were walking in a wilderness with a gun that wasn't loaded. I would say that Otzi uh, is going to be in trouble this is a serious flaw in his plan for survival. But he wasn't completely unarmed. He was carrying a weapon far advanced for his time. The Iceman's copper axe surprised archaeologists, forcing them to revise the timeline of history. Before Ertzi, 
Scholars didn't think Alpine cultures learned to smelt and work copper until about 2000 BC. But carbon dating showed that the Iceman's axe is far older than that. This meant his people already knew how to heat copper-rich rock up to 1100 degrees centigrade, hot enough to extract the metal from the ore and to design and create molds for fashioning tools. The discovery of the axe meant Ertzi steps out of the age of stone tools a thousand years before experts thought possible. To be that far ahead, so far back, this is simply incredible. This is one find that changes forever what we think about the past. The mind that can create that copper axe is practically, and for all purposes, the same mind that can create a computer, a circuit board. In other words, Atsi is us. For years after the Iceman was discovered in 1991, scholars believed he had frozen to death in an alpine storm. But how could someone so in tune with his environment get caught out by bad weather? Experts searched for other clues to explain his death. The body was CT scanned and x-rayed, but all they saw were some broken bones, nothing fatal. Then, 10 years after the discovery of the Iceman, Dr. Paul Gosner, a Bolzano radiologist, was studying images from the Iceman when he noticed something strange. It's this little white spot here, but you could also confuse it with the rip. It's hard to see right away. As Gosner began to look again at the original x-rays, he saw something that didn't add up. So he had a CT scan taken. This time the image left no doubt. Lodged in the Iceman's back was an arrowhead made of stone. That was a great surprise, since up until that time, we didn't know that he was shot. Did the arrow kill the Iceman? We know he was shot in the back, from slightly down below, with an arrow that penetrated his scapula, his shoulder blade. The scans revealed that the arrowhead had, in fact, struck a mortal blow. The arrowhead penetrated a subclavial artery so that Otzi bled to death very, very quickly. But who killed the Iceman? And why? The desire to solve this ancient mystery drives researchers back to the body again. In the operating theater at the Bolzano Museum, nearly two dozen international researchers assemble for the chance to examine the mummy. One of their first objectives is to see if they can get a closer look at the arrowhead. Over two decades, scientists have learned a great deal about Ertzi. From his skeleton, they know he was about five foot two. Muscle development in his legs indicates frequent mountain walking. The softness of his hands suggests he wasn't a farmer working the earth, but perhaps a hunter or a shepherd. Study of his bones reveals that he died in his 40s, an advanced age for his time. Identifying marks include over 50 enigmatic tattoos. Biological anthropologist Albert Zink is head of the Institute for Mummies and the Iceman. Together with Dr. Egarta Wiegel, Zink is leading the autopsy. 
we're all a little bit excited and also nervous because we have a lot to do and we also have to be sure that the Iceman doesn't have any damage due to this investigation. After a night spent outside his freezer, Ertzi is thawing nicely. As the mummy melts, he starts to sag. To prevent the body from falling apart, scientists place him in a special box. The box will allow them to move the body without damaging it and without altering the position of the limbs. You can see the mummy is well defrosted, tissue is soft, so I think that we can start now with the investigations. Body parts that were frozen now move. The post-mortem must stick to a tight schedule. Each group has only a set time to conduct their particular investigations. In order to gain access to his left shoulder and the arrowhead, doctors move quickly to flip Ertzi face down. They hope the arrowhead may provide a clue to help solve one of the main mysteries of Ertzi's death. Was he killed in a skirmish with another settlement or in a fight with hunters over territory? Or was the arrowhead still in his back, shot there by one of his own? Perhaps a jealous rival from his clan? One clue supporting this theory is his copper axe. That axe is so advanced, some believe it marks Ertzi out as a man of great importance in his community. Zinc and Agata Vigel wonder whether the arrowhead might be able to provide other answers. So we really hope to get close to the arrowhead because the arrowhead is still inside the body and we never really saw the arrowhead. And so we really hope to get close to it and maybe even to see what's going on there. Guiding an endoscope, they are now within almost a centimeter of the actual arrowhead, but their route is blocked by tissue. This way in won't work. With minutes ticking by, Agatha Vigel has to make a crucial decision. So far, they have used existing access routes. If Agatha Vigel gives the okay to cut the Iceman in a new spot, they will be able to gain access to the Stone Age arrowhead. But this creates a dilemma. While he wants to learn all he can about the mummy, he must keep it from harm. The Iceman's body is a kind of protected landscape, an archaeological site older than Stonehenge. So the Iceman is not just an extremely cold case. He's considered a cultural treasure. They cannot perform a standard destructive autopsy Ertzi is a human time capsule, still intact after over 5,000 years. Can they avoid altering him forever? Ertzi is the world's oldest intact human being. Now the investigators have to decide whether to risk damaging him permanently. Though investigators have known for a decade that the Iceman was killed, no one has ever seen the actual murder weapon. It's the last piece of unexamined evidence remaining. The team going after the arrowhead is now tantalizingly close. But there is no way to penetrate the tissue without cutting it. The chief conservator decides to play it safe and move on without making a new incision.
Though the arrowhead is critical, it's not the only evidence in the case. The theory that Ertzi was killed in a skirmish with a rival settlement or band of hunters seems to be supported by microscopic signs that he was on the run in the days leading up to his violent death. He's carrying tiny clues in his intestine. At different elevations, different trees release their pollen. In this region, a tree called hornbeam grows thickly lower down. Higher up the mountain, conifer forests cover the slopes. In Ertzi's intestine, scientists find a layer of hornbeam pollen. On top of that, a layer of conifer. It's a clear indication he's moving up the mountain. Oddly enough, we believe he came back down again because there's another layer of hornbeam pollen on top of the conifer pollen, which means he went up, for some reason came back down, and then went back up again to his death. What possesses a man to make such a journey unless, for life-threatening reasons, he has to move? And there is more forensic evidence that the Iceman was being pursued in the days leading up to his death. On his right hand, a deep cut slices across the palm, possibly the result of hand-to-hand -hand combat involving a knife. But this warlike scenario has one snag, and it has to do with what must have been the Iceman's most prized possession, his axe. Stone carvings found in the valley below where he died feature the same kind of axe prominently, suggesting that the weapon had great symbolic power. Why would the killers leave such a valuable object behind? It makes sense if Atsi is just a victim of a long distance kill shot, where someone would shoot him leave the arrow, leave the axe, and run away. In the search for more clues about Ertzi's killer, a new group has its turn with the body. This team are after blood, specifically in Ertzi's brain. On scans of Ertzi's skull, they can see clear signs of fracture and in pictures of the shrunken but still intact brain, some areas appear darker than others, which could either be blood or rot. If it's blood, it's proof he suffered a blunt force trauma to the head just before dying. If we really could find an evidence for a bleeding, this would prove that this was an injury that happened during the process when he was dying. The bleeding just happens if you're still alive or maybe if you're in the process of dying. So was Ertzi's skull fractured after he was struck by the arrow? Pincers threaded through holes drilled in Ertzi's cranium years ago snip samples of his brain. When analyzed, these dark clumps of brain matter test positive for blood. they confirm that Ertzi suffered a blow to the head before he died. Either he was finished off by his killer at close quarters, or Ertzi hit his head on a rock after being struck by the arrow. The investigation has lasted hours, and the body cannot remain defrosted much longer. The scientists switch the focus from aspects of Ertzi's death to search for more clues about Ertzi's life. The copper axe suggests he was a figure of some importance. But was he a farmer, a hunter, a shepherd? Was he on the run? The 
the one vital organ that may offer answers to all these questions has been missing for 20 years. Now it has been found by the same radiologist who discovered the arrowhead. Over the years, Dr. Paul Gosler has seen thousands of images of the mummy's insides. One day, while scanning the familiar images, an unexpected shape seemed to emerge. Here, we have the esophagus, lungs, and if you go further down, then you see an image that corresponds to that of an organ, a big, hollow organ. The big, hollow organ was something no one had noticed before, the Iceman's stomach. It seems impossible for everyone to have missed anything as basic as Ertzi's stomach. But it was not where it should have been. The stomach had moved. When the Iceman was found, his body was draped, face down, over a rock. For 50 centuries, tons of ice bore down on him. Squashed between the ice above and the rock below, his body flattened. While the organs inside his body were preserved intact, some of them were squeezed out of place. The stomach usually sits in the upper abdomen. When a person stands, then the stomach moves down a bit. When a person lies on his stomach, then the stomach pushes up. When a person lies on his stomach and has a ton of ice on top of him, then the stomach is pushed up even further. You don't see the stomach with an endoscope because it's too far up. The team assembled to explore the stomach first tries to reach it as usual, passing an endoscope in between Ertzi's teeth, through his mouth and down his throat. But the Iceman's body is too compressed. We cannot pass. We cannot pass. So the team takes a different route, through an existing incision in the abdomen. Here they find the stomach, almost in his chest, just where Dr. Gosner predicted it would be. I think this is, this is stomach here. The stomach is not only there, it is full of food, grain, fat and meat. So much material from the stomach now. Initial analysis establishes the grain as a variety of wheat called einkorn. Einkorn was one of the first grains cultivated by human beings. The meat is ibex, a kind of wild goat still roaming the Alps. This last meal confirms the Iceman lived at a turning point in history. He and his people were just beginning to farm, but they still depended on meat from wild game. Ertzi himself may have been a hunter, connected to a small farming community. However he made his living, he was well fed. After nine hours, Ertzi is sewn up again, holes plugged and flaps put back in place. This single day yields 149 biological samples, enough material to keep scientists busy for years to come. The most important of all could contain DNA.
For a mummy as old as Ertzi, techniques of salvaging DNA have only recently improved enough to gain useful information. Testing the DNA of the Iceman is difficult on one hand because he's a wet mummy and in wet mummies you have a lot of humidity. This is very bad for the DNA preservation. On the other hand, he was frozen for more than 5,000 years. And this turned out to be good because the coldness preserves the DNA. If fragments of DNA can be reconstructed, scientists can learn a great deal more about Ertzi, his eye color, medical history, and genetic mutations. But first comes the struggle to obtain the DNA. To isolate the Iceman's DNA will require the joint efforts of several specialists. For Angela Grafen, a researcher at Albert Zink's lab, helping to piece together Ertzi's genetic profile is the chance of a lifetime. I've always been very interested in mummies. When I got the chance to work on the ice mat, yeah, well, of course, I'd say everybody's, everybody's dream to work on such a, such a well-known sample as that. Days later, Angela's lab achieves the first stage, a mixture of clear water and golden-hued pure DNA. Ertzi's sample travels to a lab in the United States. They face a special challenge. Ancient DNA is very different from modern DNA for several reasons. One of the bigger issues with ancient DNA is contamination. Contamination occurs when the donor's DNA is mixed up with DNA from an outside source, whether from a microbe or another human being. Over the years, countless people have touched the mummy, leaving behind traces of their own DNA. So Agatha Vigel and Zinc took samples from deep within Ertzi's bones. They counted on the outer bone providing a natural seal to protect the inner bone from contamination. Because the procedure was so meticulous, the DNA extracted is remarkably pure. 97% is Ertzi's. But there is a mysterious 3% that doesn't belong to him. We found a, an interesting surprise when we looked at this contamination. A significant portion of the contamination was actually attributable to a microbe that causes Lyme disease. Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria spread to humans by ticks. Untreated, its symptoms can include muscle weakness, serious swelling of the joints, and arthritis. While Lyme disease is common today, the microbial DNA contained within Ertzi's genes is proof that the disease is at least as old as the Stone Age. It's the oldest trace of Lyme disease ever identified. Ertzi's ancient DNA is a first. His DNA has an actual body connected to it. And there are more revelations to come. On the chromosomes of the genes that determine eye color, there's a marker showing that Ertzi had brown eyes. On another series of pairs, they found that Lyme disease is not the only ailment Ertzi shares with 21st century humans. Another surprising thing that we find in sequencing Ertzi's whole genome is that he had a marker for heart disease. And of course one would ask, isn't that a modern disease? Why should he have those? And we know a bit about his lifestyle. He wasn't overweight, he wasn't lazy, he didn't sit on his sofa all day. Um, so uh, where could he have got those from? In the quest to trace the origins of disease, the Iceman's genome delivers a message from 5,000 years in the past. We still think that many of the diseases are very modern diseases, are civilization diseases that just occur maybe 100, 200 years ago. Now we see that these genetic modifications were already present much, much longer before. 
Despite a lifetime of exercise and an organic diet, Ertzi's arteries look like those of a typical 40-year-old male today. Perhaps that's not so surprising. Genetically, we are almost unchanged from Ertzi. We are in a big mistake because we believe that uh, 5,000 years are a lot of time in uh, the human being development. A few genes do adapt quickly to environmental and cultural factors. His genes indicate he was lactose intolerant. He couldn't digest milk as an adult. Many people think lactose intolerance is an illness, but it's, you have to bear in mind it's not actually. It's the original state of humans. In the Stone Age, all humans were lactose intolerant. Today, about 40% of adults worldwide are able to digest milk. And in the Alps, 85% can now digest dairy products. DNA analysis suggests Ertzi lived in a time of significant change, when settlements and farming were outweighing nomadic hunters. The post-mortem examination adds to what is known about the Iceman, and it will offer an answer as to whether he was on the run. Some puzzles remain. We still don't know exactly who the mystery man was or what role he played in his culture. And until now, some experts have suggested he was being hotly pursued by enemies. But his violent end left two important clues, his ax and the absence of the arrow that killed him. The shaft of the fatal arrow was never found, suggesting the attacker got close enough to pull it from the Iceman's back. Anyone getting that close to the body would have been within reach of Ertzi's copper axe. Why was the axe left by his body? A huge mystery. Surely people knew its value. Perhaps the killer left the axe and took the arrow to avoid being discovered. If you took his axe, you'd be identified. If you left your arrow shaft, you could be identified. So to leave the axe and take the arrow says that someone is exercising great caution. They're thinking this through. Possibly they don't want to be identified as Otzi's killer. New key evidence emerges from the autopsy. It comes from Ertzi's stomach. Analysis of the extracted material reveals it's a balanced meal of meat and grain. But the most important pointer is the amount of food itself. During the autopsy, they removed nearly 200 grams of food, barely digested. They left more behind. Food remains in the human stomach for about an hour, proving Ertzi ate a large meal shortly before dying. This does not seem to be the behavior of a man running for his life, being pursued up and down the Alps by enemies. So I think now this completely changes the picture. So he really felt sure he was not fleeing for somebody because otherwise I cannot imagine that somebody is sitting down having a big meal. This tells us something new about how Ertzi died. Weigh the evidence. The missing arrow. The bleeding from his brain. A valuable copper axe left behind. A full stomach. Zinc and Descartes Vigel think this final clue tips the balance. They are now convinced 
that the Iceman was killed by somebody he knew, even a member of his own community, and he never saw it coming. With the procedures complete, the samples taken, the visiting scientists gone, Hegata Vigel prepares the body to be refrozen. During this period, I am alone with the mummy, and science is no longer the focus. But you think about how this was actually a person who lived 5,000 years ago. What is his face telling me? What is the position of his body telling me? And well, I feel a real connection with him. Among the estimated 100 billion humans who have been born and passed from the Earth, Erzsi has survived the ravages of time. Now Erzsi prepares to become the Iceman again until he is called on to give evidence once more. <laughs>